How y'all doing alive? Okay, well, we're going to try that again. How y'all doing alive? Yeah, okay, good, good. Um, so, so back in the day, I, I just need to tell you, I, I'm an 80s child. I was born in the mid-80s, just so you know. So I was raised in the 90s and all that. And so I have one of those like core memories as a child of my mom working out in our basement, our unfinished basement with the VHS going and all that kind of stuff. And those workout videos were going of like the bright blue spandex and bright pink spandex. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. And some of y'all have been here for the last couple of weeks and you know I've been doing a lot of illustrations. So y'all ready? Um, <laughs> Shay has never looked more scared in her entire life. It's like, oh no, 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 no. We got friends that are visiting and um, they would never come back again if I did that. So I decided not to do the spandex thing, but anyway. Plastered on our screen are these people who are doing these aerobics and they're doing all kinds of stuff, you know. And um, and Jane Fonda was one of like the the highlight ones. Yeah, you, yeah, you know, Jace. Yeah, Jane Fonda was one of the big ones, and um, she was one of the most popular ones. And she had a couple of popular sayings. One of them was "Feel the burn," you know, "Feel the burn," and, and it was supposed to be like you, you feel like that muscle burning. Anybody ever worked out accidentally, maybe? Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, so you're like feeling the burn. Oh man. Well, her most popular saying though wasn't "Feel the burn." It was actually one that you're going to help me out with because it's a really common one. No pain. No pain. Yeah, that's right. Come on. That's right. No pain, no gain. Um, as I was getting ready for this message today and doing some research and study, um, Googling Jane Fonda <laughs> and uh, finding this stuff out, there's a Wikipedia article actually about that no pain, no gain uh, saying that uh, explains that it was, quote unquote, meant to encourage athletes to endure physical pain, and emotional suffering to achieve professional excellence, right? And, uh, and then it goes on, the Wikipedia article says, medical experts agree that the proverb is wrong for exercise. <laughs> uh, medical experts say that actually that's not maybe a good idea. Uh, oops. I mean, at the same time, we understand that you, it does, it, the article does go on and explain that certainly there's a reality to the fact that muscle growth and development needs pain sometimes, right? I know some of y'all work out, so that's what I'm looking at you. I know you work out. Like I, 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 um, muscle growth and development, unfortunately, does need pain sometimes, yeah? Yeah, but here's why it's not always a good idea to like go the no pain, no gain route, because pain doesn't necessarily indicate, it's not a great indicator of good progress, because there's such a thing as bad pain, right? No pain, no gain. Well, you pulled a muscle, buddy, so you are in pain and you are not gaining. You pulled a muscle, or um, how many of you ever watched, I, I just, again, I'm telling you all about my own business, but anybody ever watch those videos of people doing workouts in the gym wrong? Yeah? Like, that's not how that machine works, buddy, but I'm glad somebody videoed it, because it's so funny. Um, so, no pain, no gain. Well, maybe you're doing the workout wrong. Like, maybe that pain is because you're doing the workout wrong, or maybe you're overextending a muscle, and so you're actually going to hurt yourself. You're going to tear something. And um, did you do that before, Dustin? Because that face right there you made was like, oh my gosh, overextending a muscle. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. So sometimes there's this reality of some pain and still no gain. And uh, there's nothing like suffering for no good reason, isn't there? Anyone ever been there? Uh, yeah. Honestly, though, let's be honest for a second here. Also is rough when you suffer because you did it right. And I'm kind of venturing out of the physical framework now, just so we're clear. We're moving out of the, the, the realm of talking about physical um, stuff and physical fitness. Although I will just say, just so we're all clear, God does care about our bodies, our physical bodies, and wants us to take care of them well and honor them well and, and all that. That's really important. But there's this reality that I want to get into today that sometimes you do the right thing and what results is suffering. That's why we have this wonderful saying, and again, I'm going to need you all to help me out a little bit this morning here. We have this wonderful saying that says, no good deed goes unpunished. unpunished. <laughs> Just shows our cynicism, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, no good deed goes unpunished. And, uh, but seriously, it can be rough. It can be rough when you're like, I'm doing the right thing. Like, I'm, uh, I understand, and it's some, maybe sometimes we do understand, sometimes we don't. But I understand when I, when I do the wrong thing that sometimes bad things happen. But I'm doing it right. Yeah? Yeah, anybody? Like certainly when we're dealing with God, because that's, you know, in church what we talk about a lot, and uh, as you're in your life dealing with a God who is perfectly just, like his justice is supposed to be perfect. 
And when we decide to, to maybe leave a life of sin and doing things our way and, and breaking his commands and all that, we decide to follow him. When we, cool. <laughs> She's got the answer right there. Let's hear it, Alexa. All right. Or I guess that would be Siri. Anyway, when we deprive ourselves of some pet pleasures that we have and instead we decide we're going to walk the, the straight and narrow, then God's going to, you know, like, he's going to have our backs, right? Like, when I do that, he's going to have my back, and he's going to help me out, and he's going to give me a little reward here and there. You know, like, hey, I've seen that you were, uh, you were doing this, or I saw that you're not doing this anymore. Here you go. Here's a little something, something to go ahead and thank you for that. And, and so he's going to take care of us in that way, and all as we wait to get to the great reward of heaven. So God's got our back, and that's how it's going to work. And, um, and here's how, that's not how it works, by the way. And, and that's why it's going to be tricky today, because what even happens in church world is that we say things that are true but are confusing. And here's the thing that I think we can say in the church world that's true but confusing. We're going to look at it a little bit today. It's this idea that Jesus took the suffering we deserved. As Anastasia was saying, as she um, invited us in today to lean into all that God has for us, this is the beginning of Holy Week. And so this week we're especially focused on the fact that like Jesus took the suffering that we deserved. So it's been taken? Like if it's taken, like if the suffering of this world has been taken by Jesus for us, then what ends up happening sometimes is that when the presence of suffering shows in our lives, you'll get even some like church people who will go, oh, well, that's probably because you're, you're sinning. That's probably because of sin in your life because what secret sin is God punishing you for? Um, that is the reason you're suffering. Or if we think that Jesus took our suffering, it can possibly leave us disheartened and want to quit following Jesus, at least for at least one sinful quick moment, because we're going, this is not what I signed up for. Like, I signed up for the one where Jesus takes my suffering. Yeah? Or suffering can also lead us to believe that this whole system's kind of broken. Because if we do right sometimes, and we are rewarded with pain, well then, forget this. Yeah? Because I, I can get pain and enjoy the pleasure that gets me there first. Yeah. So, Jesus took the suffering we deserved. Yes, he did. And in fact, one of the disciples, Peter, who denied Jesus three times while he's in the courtyard watching this whole moment of Jesus getting ready to suffer and die for us. Peter, one of the best friends of Jesus, goes ahead and looks and watches this trial and watches Jesus as he gets to the suffering of of, all, of the cross and all of that for us. And he starts to write, and this is our main passage today, 1 Peter 4, we're going to start in verse 1. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh. So, just pause for a second. Christ suffered in his very human physical flesh for us. Jesus was fully human and fully God. So it wasn't like when he's like getting whipped and beaten and they're pulling the, like, the beard hairs and all that kind of stuff. It's not like he's somehow going, doesn't even bother me, doesn't even hurt. No, it hurt brutally. And in fact, I don't know if any of y'all have ever seen it. I was in, this is going to date myself. I was in college when the Passion of the Christ came out and I went to a Christian college. So like Christian college kids are like, let's all drive together and watch Passion of the Christ. <laughs> Christian college kids, weird. Anyway, I, I remember seeing it in theaters and I, at some point I, I um, bought the DVD and I honestly don't think I've ever watched it on DVD because it's just so brutal to have a real life, just a real life depiction of what Jesus did. Like what we celebrate and what sometimes we even wear around our necks and things like that. Like it is brutal what Jesus did. And that's, by the way, um, why I, we've got a Good Friday service happening this Friday. And if you do come, we'd love you to come. It's going to be an hour, 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock Friday night. And would love for you to come for that hour. But I'll warn you, Good Friday service at Alive and Easter service at Alive, very different. Because yeah. <laughs> Easter we get to party and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. And on Good Friday, we know that's coming, but on Good Friday, we really stop and go, oh, dang, this really cost him a lot. Yeah. And, and, and by the way, the this is my sin. Like my, my junk wasn't just a quick little moment. It's not a little passion play. It's like Jesus actually was willing to suffer in his physical flesh and unimagine. I can't imagine it. Like, I'll be honest with you, I got a cut on my hand this week, and like, there's a couple moments this week where I've just been like, Lord, take me. Uh, the suffering I, I deal with is too, uh, I'm, I'm good joking, but like, I'm also like, 
I guess I'm definitely a dude. I don't know. I, people pick on guys sometimes for this, so maybe that's just what it is. But like, I I can handle some pain, but like I I cannot imagine to have to endure that, yeah. and to have to endure it. Going, I know I didn't do anything to deserve this. I know this is not at all because of anything I've done wrong. Because Jesus never sinned, and so I I, I know that like we've kind of covered that that part that since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, but we've only gotten to the first of three commas. So. Let's just finish out the sentence, okay? Yeah? All right, let's do it. Are you all ready? Yeah. All right. Um, Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. And I want to make sure we, like, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. I'm going to explain that in a second. So as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. And then we'll read this other part here too, just for context. For the time that has uh, passed, suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do. Gentiles is basically a word in Peter's vernacular for those who don't know Jesus. So living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. We've had enough of that, he says. The past time suffices. We've we've had enough. With respect to this, those people who do that are surprised when you don't join them in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you. But they, just so you know, will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. So I wanted us to see the, the, a bit more of the context here, but I, I really want us to just focus on this single sentence. So let's go back to it and read that. Um, Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. I, I believe that there's something critical for us here today. And I'll just say this too at the outset of this message. Um, <clears throat> At Alive, we are a church for everybody, and, uh, and so I know that people come in to Alive, and I've been watching it and enjoying it over the years in different places with where they're at with Jesus. So wherever you're at with Jesus today, we knew you're gonna we knew you're gonna be here, and that's okay. But like today's message, just so we're all cards on the table here, is really gonna make the most sense for those of us who maybe have already decided we're following Jesus. We've dedicated our life to following Him, and we want to kind of understand a little bit more of what the suffering part looks like in it okay so that's where we're going today okay it's also important if you're kind of like checking this thing out or if you're ever going to be interested in potentially following Jesus make this the uh, the worst sales gig ever that's what we'll call this because it really is going to be the honest look at like what in all reality it looks like to follow Jesus now I say worst sales gig a little tongue-in-cheek because I've said it before here in this series there's nothing better like you're gonna suffer in life either way so I I just kind of like just so we're clear, there's nothing better, but I also want to make sure that we're, we're clear that today's message ends up being a lot more for like those of us who are, we're going to follow Jesus and then finding out that suffering still happens, and how do we navigate that, yeah? Okay, because here in this verse, in these verses actually, and a couple others we'll look at today, it's something that we need in order to frame our fight uh, against sin, because that's what we're in, a fight against sin and really letting Jesus own us and make his kingdom come in our lives. So I titled today's message, if you're a note taker, the pain of progress, the pain of progress. And, um, and just like the misunderstanding that can come from those exercise videos with Jane Fonda, um, it, it's not that pain is the goal. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I need, I need the other side to hear it. So thank you. I'm glad you got, but it's not that pain is the goal. Okay. Okay, because like that would be sadistic and also scary um, to just go, oh, pain is the goal and it's a sign you're doing it right. Hey, if you're enjoying your walk with the Lord and you're not like walking around with this like grimace, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> like literally one of our core values at Alive, one of our four core values is joy. We believe there's a joy and I'll, I'll reference it later on in the message, but there's a joy that Jesus had that helped him to endure the cross. Yeah. So joy and suffering sometimes go hand in hand. But here at Alive, I want to equip everyone as a pastor of Alive. I, my goal is to equip people to live fully alive in Christ. Yeah. And if you're a part of this church, we are equipping one another to live fully alive in Christ. Yeah? yeah. So we got to understand how to properly view suffering in the scope of our sanctification, that process of being more and more like Jesus. Because yeah. real sanctification, that process of becoming more and more like who Jesus was and is, real sanctification always comes with some suffering. That's the good news. You can just walk out right now, right? All right, I got it. Real sanctification comes with suffering. Let's jump into what Peter is saying here. because, And actually, let's jump into the most potentially compelling and confusing part of that sentence. Because he said, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. 
And uh, this is why good interpretation is really important. Like as we understand this Bible and as we um, try to make sure we understand what it's kind of saying, it's really important because um, it, it should not be interpreted, just so we're clear, that we go, okay, this says um, the person who is um, suffering stops sinning for the rest of their lives. So, uh, it's because that's simply not true. Like, you can suffer and yet still slip into sin. Yeah? Yeah? yeah. yeah. He- heck, we can, we can absolutely um, can suffer sometimes because of our sin. Yeah? yeah? yeah. I'll give you a couple examples. Like, for, for instance, we lash out and we suffer the loss of a relationship because we let our anger get the best of us. And we can lose a relationship before Christ or after Christ, like, yeah. you know, enters our lives. Um, we covet. Kind of want what someone else, somebody is really having a time act there, isn't they? <laughs> I know we all hear it, so I'll have what she's having. Anyway, um, <laughs> we covet and suffer because we're not living in contentment because we're constantly looking and going, I want what they have, I want what they have, I want what they have. Or we covet and suffer in actually really tangible ways because I want what they have and we spend money we don't have in order to get what they have and now we're in debt because there's this wonderful thing called credit cards. So we can have things we don't actually have the means to have. Um, we can suffer because of sexual promiscuity. You can have, you can get sick, but you can also be, have your heart be broken, and it can be regret of, it made sense in the moment, but now it really doesn't make sense that I let that happen. Um, there can be the suffering that comes with greed. You suffer the, the loss of the reward of generosity because you're so busy holding on to things, you miss out on all the opportunities to be a part of generously blessing others. So there's a lot of suffering that can happen because of our sin, yes? And I could go on because sin causes suffering. Um, or, but like I said, we can suffer even for good and yet still find that we have to struggle to say no at times to sin. So you can suffer for doing good and still struggle with sin. So this ceasing from sin can't mean that like, hey, if you struggle for, for doing the right thing, you won't have to you know, fight with sin anymore. So, so what does it mean? Um, let's think of it like this, okay? I want to try and break this down a little bit. Let's think of it as like a financial comparison. Let's say <clears throat> you want to buy a house. You want to buy a house, yeah? Okay, so you told everyone. You even met with a couple realtors to see which one was the one, and then you talked to your bank about a loan and what it would look like to take out the loan that you'd need. Um, you went to open houses every Sunday, even the rainy Sundays, you went and checked out houses and all that. You checked the Zillow app every day. You got your app, your daily Zillow app notification of the day, you know, and read it and, and on and on and on and on. You kind of invested in, I, I really, I really want a house. Yeah? Yeah. Y'all with me? Yeah. But in this fictional scenario, you make a moderate income. I know you all are very, very wealthy, but in this one, you make a moderate income and in this scenario, you spend all that you make. And actually, you spend a little bit more than you make. If you really crunch the numbers, you're finding that that, that credit card thing, yeah, you're actually in that like student loan and that car loan and that other loan and that thing. You, you're actually, you're not, you're not saving anything, you're, you're spending all. So you wanna buy a house, but you also kinda don't want to. Because the proof isn't quite there to show that it's truly a deep desire. Y'all with me? Just as a reminder, our struggle with sin is a struggle over beliefs and affections and desires. So as we're talking about sin and fighting sin, like it's really about like what do we actually want? Because you can say, I want a house, but your actions show something differently. And you can like deal with the actions, but if you don't actually deal with the desires, you're, you're not getting as far. So let's say back to the house, that you want to buy a house and you have moderate income. But in this scenario, instead of just kind of spending all that you make, this time around, you go ahead and say, you know what? I'm cutting out eating out. Like, I'm just not gonna, we're not gonna eat out. I'm gonna buy groceries and I'm gonna learn how to cook. I'm gonna watch some YouTube videos. I don't know, and figure it out. And uh, you cut out cable and you're like, I'll watch birds instead of watching TV shows. I don't know, I'll figure something out. Um, and, and you know what, God, <laughs> you wear last year's fashion. I know, you're sacrificing, Austin, you're sacrificing. You're sacrificing. You're making it work. You're not buying uh, new outfits as much as you'd like to and all that. And in fact, you're not going ahead and seeing that. that. Have you seen that movie? No, I haven't seen a movie in a, it's been about a couple years, you know. And you, you're not on every streaming service. You, you have intentionally done away with some things. You're missing out. I mean, again, metaphorically here, you're suffering because it was, it's proving something. You really want to get a house, right? You're, you, you know that because you're willing to suffer for it. Because it's like, 
like anything else we can say we want. Like when you suffer for it, then it's kind of like, oh, mm, I think you actually do want it. You know, and Peter's, Peter is writing and seeing this in first century Christians because he is a first century Christian, one of the first people to follow Jesus and his model of living and his freedom that he purchased on the cross. And Peter's going, you know what I've seen? The people who are like willing to suffer, they're done with that sin thing. Not saying they don't struggle with sin, but it's just saying sin is not the master of their life anymore. They have ceased from sin because look at their lives. They're going, I'll suffer for this thing. And Peter didn't even know that one day he would invest his life into the proof that he really believed Jesus was the Messiah. That he would actually sacrifice and lay down his life to say, no, I'm not, there's nothing better out there. So if you want to kill me because I believe in Jesus, okay. But Peter saw clearly, whoever suffered in the flesh, experiencing all this pain and all that, for Jesus' sake, their relationship with, um, with sin is, is not the same. It's some pretty good proof. It's a part of the progress. And Jesus told us as much as this in Luke uh, 9, when he says, uh, Luke 9, 23, and he said to all of them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me for whoever, who, for whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. There's some three kind of classic parts to this thing. The denying self is one of the big ones, Yeah. That's like denying pet pleasures, things that you want maybe, whether it's sin or not. You're denying yourself some things that you want. So sometimes that's, again, I want this sin, but I'm going to deny myself. Or sometimes it's not even a sin. But, um, but let me just ask you guys this pointed question. How can you or I expect to live freed from sin if we're, on, if we're not willing to even be inconvenienced by righteousness? Like, if righteousness inconveniences us, that like right living, and we're not willing to be inconvenienced, how could we expect to live freed from sin? But here's the thing about denying ourselves. It also doesn't just mean like deny myself things that I want. It means denying myself the ability and the position of being the Lord of my life, the ruler of my life, the shot caller of my life. Denying myself means I go, okay, actually, Jesus, you're going to call the shots. You're going to tell me what I'm doing. You're going to lead the way. You're going to be the one who kind of indicates where I'm going. This life I'm living isn't on my terms now. It's, it's what Jesus wants. So that's one of the things Jesus calls us people to. And then it gets even easier because if that wasn't sacrificial enough, he says, take up your cross. And I have honestly wondered this week and, and before too, but like, what would that have meant to the disciples who didn't know that Jesus was going to die? I mean, he had told them, but they still didn't know. Like he's telling them all the time, I'm going to die. And they're like, yeah, but you're, but you're not because you're going to like take over Rome and all that. And they had this other idea of what the Messiah would do. But when Jesus says, take up, his, take up your cross, they didn't know that Jesus was going to one day die on a cross. But I, either way, the, the way they would view Jesus telling them, following me means taking up your cross, it means sacrifice either way. Because there's no view of taking up your cross that isn't like sacrificial. And that's suffering. The, the abundant life that Jesus offers somehow goes through some dying. Dying to be alive. Huh, that's like the series title. Uh, so, and, and it gets even better. Y'all still with me? gets even better because it says, um, <clears throat> let him deny himself and take up his cross. Okay, yeah, yeah, somebody said it, but uh, let him deny himself and take up his cross. Good. So it's like, it's good, good. So I, I did it once and I did this really momentous sacrificial thing for Jesus. Jesus, did you see that? I, I, I decided not to do that thing, or I've given up that thing. I, I, I denied myself, and I took up my cross. There was this moment at work where I, I lost my job because I was not willing to do that thing that had no integrity that my boss was asking me to do. And I said, you know what? I am taking up my cross, and I won't even suffer for what I believe. And so I'm, I'm good now, right? And Jesus is like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's just do this again tomorrow. Right? <laughs> Let's do it again tomorrow. No, it, it's, so it's not enough to like have these one-offs where we're like living sacrificial. Romans 12.1 even says that we are called to be living sacrifices, which is this indication of like actually you live out a sacrificial life where you are on the regular, you are living in a way that puts yourself on the altar every day and going, whatever you need to take from me, whatever you want to do with me, Jesus, you can do it. So again, if you don't follow Jesus yet, if you want to sign up today, because uh, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's kind of a, it's kind of a unapologetic, like I want your life. I, I want to have your life so that I can do something with it. And um, my dad once said uh, very accurately, he's like, the, the thing about the hard part about this whole dying to yourself thing 
is that sometimes it really feels like you're dying. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, that's profound, Dad. I'm going to have to I'm gonna write that one down. Because <clears throat> it really feels sometimes like you're like, well, like dying. Like this does not feel fun. This, this doesn't feel great. Now, granted, I've had moments where like it didn't, and then later on I have the sense of like, oh, but it was. And I get to like feel and sense and, and know like deeply, okay, this was worth the, the thing. But like sometimes it's just not fun. But the fortunate thing is that Jesus isn't done, that he goes on and says, okay, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. So Jesus, the Messiah, <clears throat> says to his disciples, but also to those who would follow him later on. So like us, if we're willing to even centuries later follow him, he says, uh, follow me, walk with me, talk with me. Let's, let's have a relationship. Let me, let me speak into your life. Let me help you journey through some of those challenges that you're going to face. Let me come along and encourage you and comfort you. Let my words speak life to you. Let me teach you some of the wisdom of how to really navigate this life because uh, I've been here since the beginning, Jesus says, so I know a thing or two. And uh, you can trust me and you can walk with me and talk with me. And Jesus inviting his followers to follow him, I think, is a couple things. One, it means to follow his teaching. And sometimes that's all we do is we think, oh, we're just following his teaching like he's some wise, um, you know, person. But it's not just that. He does have some wisdom to give, but it's also following his example. So it's cool because it's not just his teaching, but he actually lived the perfect life. So we get to follow his example. And it's not even just that. It's actually the fact that we can currently follow Jesus because he promised when he left this earth, when he told his disciples, all right, my time here is done, that I'm going to give you my spirit, and that spirit's going to help you. He's going to speak to you. He's going to guide you. And so following Jesus actually kind of means just listening in to God's spirit speaking to us in this moment. Like, you don't need to come in, and I'm not trying to knock this faith tradition. I'm just saying, you don't need to come in and talk to your pastor as if I'm a priest, that I'm the arbiter between you and God, and I have the holy words that only you, you, can't, you can't get otherwise. You can actually pray in your car on 95, which you should do, by the way. Uh, and... Uh, and you can hear from God. And you can be in the middle of a situation. I'm excited because uh, I think next week we're going to get to hear a testimony like this. But you can go through a moment that like anxiety is racking you. And you can go, Scripture tells me not to be anxious, but in everything to cast my cares on him because he cares for me. I'm going to cast my cares. I'm going to throw them at him. I'm going to cast them. I'm going I'm to cast my cares because Jesus wants that. Like, he's the good shepherd who leads us through the valley of death to streams of living water where he sets a banquet table out in front of all of our enemies. That's a cool thing. And yet Jesus, who does that, also suffered at the hands of his enemies, mm -hmm. brutally. And a vast majority of his disciples, those 12 disciples that followed him, um, the majority of them, vast majority of them, suffered. S suffered with their lives. Like, they died because they decided to follow Jesus. And all around the world today, in places that are very different than Fredericksburg, Virginia, there are people today who will and are suffering, and some of them will give up their lives because they're committed to following Jesus. And... Um, and many of us, even in the States who won't suffer that kind of thing, will suffer different kinds of losses in our lives if we choose to follow Jesus. So whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. These people back in Jesus' day, as well as all the way to today, and maybe even us, the reason why is because we're going, you know what, there's something better than physical pleasure. Like, yeah, I could have things maybe that I want now, but there's something actually better. So I'll suffer a little bit in this way, because I'm going to get something that's even better. Something maybe that I don't even see yet. But my affections are for something that maybe I don't see right now. My belief is in something that I don't see right now. But that's where faith comes in. Because it's like, I, I don't need to see it to know that it's true. And so as, um, as verse 2 of 1 Peter 4 said, So as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. Basically, it's saying, as many little sand pebbles as are in my hourglass that I don't even know how many, you know, sand pebbles there are in my human life, life in this earth, my flesh, time on this earth. I'm going to spend the rest of my time, I'm going to invest the rest of my time, however that might be, to go ahead and to not seek my own immediate passions and the things that like are carnal and that everyone and anyone given of themselves would do. Things like the Bible talked about greed and lust and gossip and division and drunkenness and self-righteousness or laziness or just selfishness, anything like that. And instead, I'm going to invest it into the will of God. And uh, that's because we have this like, new nature that God gives us where he goes, actually, I'm going to give you something better to chase than just what makes you feel like you're living your best life. I'm going to actually get you your best life. I'm going to actually offer you the will 
of God. And I referenced it earlier, but like actually this makes me think of Romans 12, 1, where it says, I think we got it. Yeah. I appeal to you, therefore, my brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies. Now, let's, let's actually hold on a second, because I want to give us some context here, just to understand what we're about to read. He says, I appeal to you, therefore. And I know he jumped right in. But it's chapter 12, and he's saying, therefore. So basically what Paul has done is in chapters 1 through 11 of this book, Romans, he has gone, and this is Paul's, like, theological text. He's created this whole systematic theology. So it's a lot of theology about who God is. But Paul, and this is why I like Paul, he goes, okay, let's, let's move past the whole like heady stuff. Let's get real practical here. And so he says, therefore, with, in light of all this theological stuff, which is great to read, but we don't have time for it today, I appeal to you. He's almost like he's uh, being diplomatic as he goes into exhorting us about our ethics. And so he says, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship, which by the way means that like spiritual worship, like real worship, isn't just singing on a Sunday morning. It's the idea of going, like I wanna live my life for Jesus. So it's not just about us uh, singing songs on key, it's about living sacrificially. It's about not just playing an instrument, it's being uh, actually an instrument of what God wants us to do in this life. It's not about us having our guitar in tune, it's about us being in tune with the Spirit of God. It's not just about having a good soundboard, but letting Jesus be our sounding board as we go through life and just be like, hey, can I process this with you, God? Because I could really use some help. We're, we're worshiping God by walking this life where it's like, I'm going to live sacrificially, where it's not just me on autopilot, what makes sense to me? Jesus, what do you want? And when he says sometimes, I want you to do this, and we go, oh, I don't want to do that. We go, oh, yeah, living sacrifice. And we're denying ourselves, and we're taking up our cross, and we're following Jesus. So that leads to us not being conformed to the world, but being transformed by the renewal of our mind. And this is kind of cool, that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God. That's the will of God that was mentioned in Peter's letter. What is good and acceptable and perfect? And that testing isn't like a multiple choice test. Like, gosh, I wonder what is the will of God? It's the idea of like, when he says testing here, he's meaning basically like, let's uh, kick this thing and see if it works. You know, like it's like the testing it, let's, let's try this thing out and see if it works. And uh, Jesus is basically going, as you don't conform to the pattern of the world, as you and I are transformed in the way that we think, as we come to God and go, you know what, my worship is going to be, I'm going to live sacrificially towards you, following you. You're going to find that, that Jesus is so good, that Jesus is so rewarding. Following him is so rewarding. It's so fulfilling that followers of Jesus have, for centuries and thousands of years, would go like, I'll die for it because there's nothing better. I mean, if life is going to always involve some sort of suffering, right? There's simply no way to avoid suffering entirely. You might as well suffer profitably. If you can gain a whole world and lose your soul, why not instead then uh, gain a new and free soul if you even have to like pay for, with the world for it? You know, why not instead of all the things you can gain in this world, why not instead gain peace? Yeah. Why not instead gain some freedom? Why not instead gain some hope for this life? By the way, I can't help myself, but I'm going to let you know. We're starting a new series, not next Sunday, because next Sunday we end this series on Easter, Dying to be Alive. Don't miss it. It's Easter Sunday. But the week after that, we're doing a new series for a few weeks. I don't know how many yet, called Hope Fully. Because I'm really convinced that like we have a hope crisis <clears throat> where we're supposed to have it, and yet um, a lot of us, we're just beaten up by life, and we're cynical, and we, we need some more of it. So, But why not gain from Jesus the joy and the hope that he offers? Do you, do you want the house? No. Like, let's see. Let's see. Like, Let's suffer so that we can show, like, yeah, that's how much I want it. I'm willing to. I'm not looking for suffering, but I'm willing, if it comes my way, um, to, to let it exist because I, I'm really convinced, that convinced, that I want this by acknowledging that it's a part of, suffering is a part of the process of progress, and we can't shrink back from it. Hebrews 10 says, but recall the former days when after you were enlightened, so again, this is a message that even the writer of Hebrews is kind of speaking to people who have decided to follow Jesus, and he kind of lights up. Oh, by the way, that was like that one week where we had the, like the light up here, the little lamp and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. He lights it up. You're enlightened. You endured a hard struggle with sufferings. I mean, again, isn't that a great sales pitch right there? After you met Jesus, you got to endure a bunch of hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. So basically, sometimes it was your friends who were beat up and mistreated. Because some of us, actually, it's one thing we can do it, but it's watching people we love. 
For you had compassion on those in prison for the faith in this situation, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property. Oh, the government's going to go ahead and be like, well, take advantage of this belief system and steal your stuff. I mean, all kinds of things are happening since you knew that you yourselves you had a better possession and an abiding one. You see how he's playing this perspective here? Mm-hmm. It's not that we don't care about stuff. Like, I, I lock my doors. I try to remember to do it. You know, like, I don't want people to come in and just plunder our stuff. Uh, I, I, but, but if it's a cost of me following Jesus, then I got something better anyway. Yeah. Things break. Yeah. They wear out. Therefore, he says, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, oh, there's that again, right? When you and I have done the will of God, when we've, we've laid down, when we're living sacrifices, and we've done the will of God, that you may receive what is promised. For, it says, yet a little while, and the coming one will come, and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith, God says, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him, but we are, I mean, I feel like Hebrews is preaching at this point, but we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. And let me just kind of real quickly clarify something. Y'all still with me? Okay, good. Our faith that preserves our souls is not, be, is not able to do that because it's so strong. Our faith. That's a misunderstanding of how faith works. So sometimes we're like, oh, I need to have more faith. If I'm, if I'm preserving my soul, how on earth I need to have more faith? Here's what I would say. Faith is only as strong as the object you have faith in. So you can have great faith in a really pathetic thing, and it doesn't actually mean it's strong faith. And you can have a mustard seed of faith, like just like the littlest bit of it, but in something that's great, like Jesus. And you can find that actually I do have the faith that preserves my soul. Not because I am preserving my soul, but because of the one I have faith in is able to preserve, protect, and watch over my soul. See, Jesus showed us that example when, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame that's associated with such a death of dying on a cross, and said to God in the garden leading up to it, not my will, God, but your will be done. Can you imagine having that kind of thought process? Like, as we're in, like, again, Holy Week and we're processing this, can you imagine having the thought process of, same one as Jesus, not my will, but your will be done, as you walk through this life? Well, that's exactly it. First Peter, back to it again. Let's read it one more time. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. Yeah? For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. It's about arming yourself. So, Nathaniel, can you hold that for a second? Yeah, thanks for helping me out again. Um, <laughs> And yes, I have a fatter head than the guy that I'm borrowing this from, so John was, John, how did I do this? Is that, that's not it. That's it, right? No. I literally tried this out beforehand. Is it, it's supposed to go behind, John. It's supposed to go behind. Oh, yeah. Okay, well, that's not fun at all. But, all right. Oh, you definitely... You definitely put this on first. Okay. Oh, man. I've never looked more attractive, I know. This process is... Really? Ah. Oh, it hurts. Okay. All right. Yeah, I'm not going to strap it up. The funny thing is, is that... Um, okay, I'm going to have to do it. You got to lift the front flap up. And then, yeah, you want to do, do it, it, you can do it, it but I'm not doing it. All right, anyway. Uh, this is funny because actually my buddy, um, this is uh, Brandon Woodard. He spoke the first Sunday that we were back in um, from uh, sabbatical. So he finished out our series that we did. And, uh, and he was telling me about it yesterday, so he was giving it to me. He's like, the funny thing is it works really well because it takes you a while to put it on and you have to like, work for it. And I'm like, that sounds like it's going to be hard. And, uh, and that's kind of the reality of it is that for you and I, we're called to arm ourselves with the same way of thinking. And it'd be so easy if it was just like, I love wearing my little like, snapbacks, you know? Just give me all, you know, you know I love my snapbacks. Like, I'll throw a hat on real quick and easy. This hat is not as easy to put on. First of all, you gotta get the right size, I found out. And this vest is definitely not like, uh, you know, the vest I'll be wearing for Easter next week, maybe. You know, a little like pastel kind of thing. This one takes, this one takes some work. And this one also, he, 
Brandon just, just like, all know his business. business. He, he has this other church, church building, or their new church building. I was like, why don't you have it at home? Because he has dumbbells or something, or kettlebells underneath the uh, stage that they're building, and he'll put this on as a weighted vest and do workouts there. I was like, oh, I do spiritual exercises. But he, he said that it takes take some time to put on, and it, it really it, it weighs a lot. But here's the thing, that pastel vest, vest I'm not wearing next week, it wouldn't, ha it wouldn't help me out in like a war zone. It might look good, but it wouldn't help me. And, and, and Peter's going, like, listen, you can hold on to the promise of victory in your, in, victory in your life. That when we celebrate next week, Jesus dying for our sins and then being raised to life truly purchased for us the victory that we need in our lives. But don't get fooled into them thinking, okay, so now life's going to be easy for you. You just got to believe and have faith and everything's going to go your way and everything's going to be easy. No, the enemy's coming after you. Throwing darts at you, roaring like a lion, slithering like a snake, trying to get people to oppose you and work against you so that you can go ahead and have the worst possible go of following Jesus and living this life that he has for you that you can possibly have. They're going to even sometimes mistreat you for doing the right thing. You're actually doing it the right way. You're doing the right thing. And what is your reward? Punishment. And so we don't stand a chance against that in our own strength, with our own arsenal. Good news again. But we're not in our own strength. So we've been given the mind of Christ. And Jesus who wore a crown of thorns said, hey, let, let's go ahead and let's get you some, uh, something that's going to affect your head. It's going to get you in my mind. So arm yourself with that. And I think that there's two ways that we arm ourselves with Jesus' thinking. It's one, the things I should give myself to. What does Jesus think about the things that are really worth giving my life to? And then secondly, the purposes and motivations that should be behind why I do them. Yeah. That's what I think the, the way that like, our thinking is arming ourselves to navigate the challenges of doing the right thing and sometimes still suffering is going, what is the right thing? Jesus, how do you think the right things? Because yeah. Yeah. I don't know, some of you all, but I think the wrong things. I'm like, this is definitely valuable. This is right. And God's like, that is dumb. <laughs> so I need the mind of Christ. And then I also need the mind of Christ to help me motiv be motivated for the right reasons to yeah. do them. My main weapon against sin in my life is the mind of Christ. So, so I would say it this way. I can suffer successfully if I am armed with the mind of Christ. I can suffer successfully if I'm armed with that. That's why I need to cling to Christ if I'm ever going to succeed. I'm going to take this off just now because it does not feel comfortable. <laughs> uh, I know, a little <laughs> suffering for the right reasons. So, so quickly. As I cling to Christ, I can start thinking and seeing things the way that he did. And it was cool then, my priorities start to shift. And I'm just, I'm just being honest with you because that's how I think church should go. My priorities start to shift. There are sometimes when following Jesus, he works in people's lives in different ways. So sometimes we'll come in and be like, that whole struggle that's been deep-seated in your life, gone. In a moment. I wish that that would be how it worked for more of us, but usually our, our priorities start to shift as we follow him. And he's leading us. Some things in our life, because of that priority, some things actually start going up in value. Mm -hmm. didn't, that, that would have never been important to me. Yeah. And then some things mysteriously start going down in value. That doesn't matter to me. Well, our life takes on a new look, and what's cool is we eventually do too. We start exercising new muscle groups that we didn't have before. There's spiritual muscles we didn't even have, we didn't even know we had before. And now they're starting to get toned. We're starting to realize, actually, I'm bulking up in good ways and turning down in good ways. I'm losing weight that so easily entangles me on this race that Jesus has me going on. And instead, I'm gaining the endurance to push beyond the struggles and setbacks that I'm going to deal with in life. And instead, I can run because I'm looking at Jesus. I'm going, he did it first. He's the one that's on the other side of the thing going, come on, keep going. You got this. And he's giving me his mind so that I can think the way I'm supposed to think so I can do that. And, um, and we can still struggle, but man, I'm so glad that Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. That heaven is real and there's a place where there's going to be this, this struggle gets to be over. So in the meantime, I want to get to know the king of that place as best as I can in advance. Yes? And wisely come to him, humbly, laying down at his feet all of my weakness, all of my frustration, all of my guilt, and my sorrow, and my shame, and everything else that I have, good, bad, and ugly, laying it at the feet of that king and, and offering that as a sacrifice, and then, you know what gets cool? Him offering his life in exchange. Yeah. I want to end today just with a scripture. So Richard T, you can come on up. So I want to end with an exhortation that Peter, in this letter we've been reading, 1 Peter, I want to 
he exhorts us, he encourages us with this uh, at the end of his letter. So let's read it together. He says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. So we live in this life humbly and laying ourselves down and going, is it ever going to be? Yes, at the proper time, he'll exalt you. Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded. Be watchful, he says. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. So resist him. Firm in your faith that doesn't see it right now, but believes that Jesus is who he says he is and can do what he says he can do. So you're firm in your faith, resisting him, knowing that the same kinds of suffering you're dealing with are being experienced by your brotherhood and sisterhood around the world. And after you've suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, is going to delegate to someone else. No, not even that. Will himself, come on, will himself restore you and confirm you and strengthen you and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Friends, I don't know about you. I need to be restored. I need the confirmation of the things that Jesus has said true about my life to be confirmed again and again. I, I need to be strengthened for this junky life sometimes that I'm having to live. And I'm living a pretty blessed life. <laughs> and yet the struggle is real. And suffering sometimes isn't just a um, possible side effect. It's an actual, this is coming out of that reality of what I'm dealing with. Following Jesus the right way is causing suffering sometimes. So how am I going to make it through? How are you going to make it through? Friendly, make it through by clinging to Christ and knowing that, you know what? If I have the mind of Christ, I can suffer successfully. So, so where is that at with you then? Is, for some of us in this room, there's different applications for how we, we take what we've heard and we do something with it. For some of us, it's like, you know what? I need to accept Jesus. Like, I need to actually, I'm gonna, I need to follow Jesus and accept the grace that they talked about there in that verse that allows me to have all those things. Because it's not like you're going to earn it. That's just not how it works. You couldn't. I couldn't. But he's willing to give it. We just have to accept it. And accepting it on his terms and not our terms. That's a big thing too. But it's a free gift. So, some of us, it begins there. Some of us, it begins with then, uh, maybe it's a shift in how we've been thinking about suffering in our lives. We need to go ahead and remember, oh, you know what? Actually, suffering is something that gets to give God glory sometimes. Not like I should be seeking it out. Because he's also, he's also glorified when we find joy in him. But I need to find ways to worship in the suffering. So we all need to start reframing the suffering so you can worship in it. Because your worship will go many levels deeper. And it will be so beautiful. Because worship that comes from a place of like, my life is great, let's celebrate. It's good and God loves that. But worship in the prison that Paul and Silas know about, there's something profound about that. And that's what makes other people go, wait, what is going on with you? And you're like, I'm, I'm armed. I'm armed with something that the, the stuff can't, this stuff can't go ahead and mess up. And some of you, the application needs to be that they, not only are you arming yourself, but you're, you're approaching Jesus to go ahead and say, not just I'll follow you sometimes, but would you refresh my mind? I want to be a living sacrifice. I want to make sure that I'm willing to inconvenience myself and deal with some things that like aren't going my way because my way isn't the best way. Yeah. Can I pray for you? And then we're going to take communion together and just like, let's just pray because we can't do this on our own. We need his help. Jesus, you came and we celebrate that. We celebrate it every week, but we especially focus in, um, in the church world this time of year as we look at the cross and the, the empty tomb. Jesus, this isn't just a history lesson. Because people like Peter, years and years after you, you died and you resurrected and were raised again, he, inspired by the Holy Spirit, wrote this letter to people to encourage them because he knew, and you know what? This risen Jesus is still changing lives. He's still inviting us to follow him, and it's still worth it. So Jesus, thousands of years later, we're, we're praying to you and asking, would you help us? Because we can't do this thing on our own. But you don't ask us to. 
your offer that in the middle of a life that will have all kinds of struggle, that it's not a matter of no pain, no gain, keep on pushing yourself, keep on hurting yourself, keep on, you know, running to your sore, but instead you say, if there is pain in following me, it'll be worth it. And I'll arm you with the things that you need in order to fight the good fight, run with endurance, and find a day, as Peter ended his letter with, find a day where I will confirm, strengthen, and establish you fully in my kingdom. God, it takes faith to believe any of this stuff. But what we see in this life is confirmation of enough that there's, there's, this is a hard life. There's challenges. And if we're going to suffer successfully, Jesus, we, we see no one who suffered as well as you did. You did it perfectly. So would you help us? Jesus, if we're in this room and we need to begin the relationship with you, and you're prodding our hearts to do that, would we just pray, confessing our sins, believing that you are who you say you are, and will we begin the journey of what, walking in your steps? That whole idea of denying ourselves, taking up our cross, and following you, following you so that we have the abundant life you promised. And for those of us maybe who today our action step needs to be that we reframe the way we look at suffering, would you help us to have the mind of Christ that changes our minds for how we're seeing and thinking and feeling? Jesus, you didn't make light of the suffering, but you still found a way to endure it. Would you help us? Because sometimes progress hurts, but it's worth it.